What's going on, everyone? Welcome to a Friday edition of Back Your Play with Q. As always, I'm your host, Rich Quinones. Don't forget, we are brought to you by our very good friends over Played Again Sports, uh, 1450 Clemsbridge Road. I'm telling you right now, you walk in, they'll give you the best bang for the buck. I was just in there the other day. They got some new Eagles and Phillies gear, also some used sports equipment and more. Tell them you heard right here on BYP with Q, and you'll get 10% at it to your next purchase or 10% off your next order. Check them out online and just put in the location in New Jersey, Played Against Sports. Dot com. Our guy from On3 covers a great deal of college sports, Nick Costco at Nick Costco 59. Kind enough to join us for a couple moments. we got a good slate of games. I think, by the way, real quick, the buzz from your Colorado Buffaloes, the, the, the bloom is off the rose, my friend, because, oh, my goodness. I mean, you're talking about a huge lead. I'm going to start pawning merchandise off at halftime, <laughs> and then you turn around. I mean, and by the way, I didn't hear from you. The other game that we mentioned a little bit, my phone was uh, Radio Silence Crickets about a week and a half ago. Ah, uh, well, what can you do? So I, I didn't want to bust your, out of that I, one. I didn't want to bust your uh, chops too much. So, but yeah, Colorado. I mean, they are on a bye week this week, so you look ahead to the UCLA next week and. Yeah, just real quick on them. It kind of stinks for them right now because you blow a 29 nothing lead at halftime. You lose an overtime to Stanford, which, you know, all, all due respect to Stanford, they're not what they were in the Pac-12. I mean, again, they're going to – for all we know. You know lose that game. I mean, they're going to be an ACC school next year. So, like, this is not your this is not your father, Stanford, right now. So, you can't lose that game. You're right. Uh, the, the whole Shadur Sanders, you know, uh, merchandise uh, advertisement on Instagram at halftime, he has to have some people for that. Obviously, I, I don't think he did that himself at halftime, although it wouldn't shock me. But I don't think he did that uh, himself. Oh, but also, not a good look, especially after you lose and blow a lead like that. And I'll tell you what, just long story short, Q, this is going to be – this is now, you know, Dion, you know, he's always honest in the postgame pressers. So he yeah. always keeps it real. He, you know, he ripped his own team, ripped himself. And he said, this is not, no, this is not who we are. And this is, you know, you can't lose a game like this. And yeah, you're right. You know, we, we can't blow a game like this. Now you're four and three, five games left. Look at the rest of their schedule. It is brutal. You're talking about the top teams in the Pac-12 now. Without winning that game now, Rich, they then they have to win two of these last five, which it's hard to pick out two wins now based on the way they've played this year. Yeah, they could score a lot of points, but that defense is such a liability. So, we were talking just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, like I'd be, you know, remember I told you in the winter, bowl I'd be eligible. stunned. Yeah, yeah, I'd be stunned if they weren't going to be bowl eligible. I said that back in December. Now I'm a little wary on it. Now am I going to stick to my predictions? Stick to my guns? Of course, I think they could squeak out two more wins somehow. Uh, maybe against. I know Arizona is probably the most likely win on the schedule, but they're a tough team. Uh, the rest of them, I don't know, man. UCLA, Oregon State, I think they still have to play um, Utah as well. I mean, it's a brutal stretch coming up for Colorado, and they might have cost themselves the uh, postseason with that loss to Stanford. I think it just goes to a young team, an immature team, and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll grow into that role, if you will. And uh, the maturation process needs to be there. But, you know, the buzz, the luster, it's let's be honest, man, it's 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 gone. And and maybe it's a good thing they're not playing this weekend to kind of, you know, the spotlight's not on them per se. And they right. Get I wouldn't say the luster is gone. It's not at. Apocaly apocalyptic levels like it was the first three <laughs> weeks where you could they could do no wrong or the, it was the biggest thing since sliced bread the biggest cliche that. in the world I, but I, don't, I don't think i don't think the luster is gone and i would say if if they win you know say if they upset ucla especially if ucla is still ranked by next week it, it, it's all coming back and they're like all right now they're five and three four games yeah. like who else can they upset um and you know if they pull off another upset are they gonna back in the top 25 if they're an eight or nine win team all that talk is gonna come back if they win next week but um i think it's good that they've been humbled a little bit. Now I'm not saying I appreciated the cockiness, uh, but I will say for Colorado's sake, you know, they embrace that because they truly believe they can win every football game. Right. And, you know, you look at the USC game, they almost came all the way back. And you, if it weren't for USC putting up 48 points, right. Colorado might come all the way back and win that football game. And obviously you blew the lead against Stanford. So we're talking about a few plays here and there. And again, it's the what if game, but you're talking about a few plays where you flip those two games on their head they're six and one, and they're arguably a top fifteen, if not maybe close to a top ten team. With their only loss being to Oregon. Now again, it's hindsight's twenty twenty. It's the what if game, and are they really that good? No, but again, it just it just goes to show you how amazing that is. You know, a couple of plays here and there, and we're talking about a totally different scenario. Sure. Yeah, on on any level. I mean, you mm -hmm. see it on Saturdays, you see it on Sundays. Absolutely. Uh, in the NFL, uh, marquee game of the weekend, Penn State 
Ohio State, uh, two squads, six and oh, Ohio State's laying five. Penn State comes in seventh ranked team, Ohio State, third ranked team in the nation. If we're, we're looking for that James Franklin, that signature win, here's your opportunity against a team in the Buckeyes that, you know, listen, we know these games over the last several years, you know, get a little dicey here and there, some bounce they of the can, ball yep. and goofy plays. For me right now, if I look at this, I, I think that's a tough spot for Penn State to go in on the road. But we're going to I think we're going to learn more about Penn State than we are about Ohio State. We kind of know what Ohio State is, but I think right. if Penn State goes on the road. Forget about even covering the number. If they mm -hmm. win this game outright, that speaks volumes for what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you, you, you mean you said forget the number, forget covering. Yeah, if Penn yeah. State covers. I mean, is anybody really going to be that shocked that they lose by a field goal at the end of the game, no, or they lose by not four? Not really, because these games are usually always close. But again, Penn State has not won this game since 2016. That's yep. actually the last time they won the Big Ten, and it just seems like I mean that that we're approaching. We're, we're on the uh, other side, so we're closer to a decade ago compared to you know maybe three years ago as to when James Franklin had that last signature win, which was a big 10 title. And people forget about that because they didn't make the playoff that year, because they already had two losses, but James Franklin has won a big 10 title before it just, he's put, he's been put more on the spotlight since then, or I should say under the microscope because of his long-term contract extension. It came on the heels of that Mel Tucker deal. And again, that's a different story about Mel Tucker, but it came on the heels of that one. So they made the long-term commitment to James Franklin, Penn state did, but they haven't been uh, Ohio state. Now and they haven't been they haven't been back to a Big Ten title game since then. It's been all Ohio State and obviously the last two years it's been uh, Michigan. But Penn State has an opportunity this week to say we're not going to be third tier in our own division. Now I've seen a lot of conversation back and forth this entire season. This is the year Penn State has their best shot to knock off those big two it, yeah. within their own division. But then as you get closer to this game on Saturday, they're like, well, Penn State they match up pretty well, but this is this is a team that more than likely is still a year away. Well, which is it? Now, I think they could they could prove either which one, but I feel like it's a cop-out. I feel like Penn State is more than enough talented or more than talented enough to beat Ohio State on the road. Now, it's in the horseshoe, which is going to be very difficult to uh, to win. We've seen Ohio State kind of catch their stride a little bit. Kyle McCord's playing better. Marvin Harrison Jr. is getting involved in the offense a little bit more. Uh, the running back by committee is somehow still working. Dallin Hayden made his debut this year. Um, you know, after the, they thought they were going to redshirt him at running back, but due to injuries, he popped in there uh, last week. So there's opportunity for him as well. Penn State, I think this is going to come down to, which, you know, I hate to just boil it down to the two quarterbacks, but it's going to come down to who makes less mistakes and who's going to make that big throw. Is it going to be Kyle McCord for Ohio State, or is it going to be the other young gun in Drew Allen? Is he going to make that big throw to say we can shock Ohio State on the road here? And if they do win this game, then you really have to put that microscope on. All right, Penn State or Michigan now. And then you also open up the can of worms of, well, what if they all beat each other? Then you have the tiebreaker scenario. They all have one loss and it gets a whole it's it's all messy in the Big Ten East. But um, Ohio State's right, rightfully favored. I do think they are going to win. But, you know, I don't think you can use the excuse of Penn State's a year away. I think this is a prime opportunity for James Franklin and company to say, you know what, we are, we are here. This is our best shot this year. Could they be better next year? Sure. Michigan and Ohio State could fall. Well, they could both get better. You never know. But I think you can't use the excuse that Penn State is, well, they're a road dog, and also they're still a little bit younger in some areas, not as a veteran-laden team. You can't use the one-year-away excuse for me. Yeah, I mean, I look at a couple of things in college football. Give me that signature win, right? So Penn State, their signature win, if you will, was against then number 24, Iowa. They blanked them 30 yeah. nothing. Obviously, Ohio State defeating Notre Dame, which was a thriller, 17-14 to 14, a couple of weeks ago. Penn State hasn't beaten Ohio State. As you mentioned, they're going to try to end a six-game skid. We don't know the identity yet of Ohio State when you really think about it. But defensively, right. statistically, we know Penn State is one of the top teams statistically – in the right. country, Ohio State's still there. I mean, I think this is – you talked about the quarterback play. To me, this is an in-the-trenches type of play um, game, if you will. Uh, line be damned in this one. I don't think we're going to see a ton of points in this game. I, I think we're going to see maybe a 24-21 type of game. Wow. Uh, they, in the they, shoe. Interesting. Yeah, I because Penn State, they can play the run really well. They play against the, – they defend well against the pass. They know how to get to the quarterback. They're a – they're a fundamentally sound tackling team, and you have to be against Ohio State. I mean, think of these matchups. Who's the one or the two players right now in Ohio State Ohio State that's got to scare the hell out of you if you're a Penn State fan? 
I mean, it's pretty much Marvin Harrison Jr. That that's the one that scares that scares you. Obviously, their, their wide receiving core is very good. Bingo. And I think Buka is there and there. Uh, but now it comes down to Penn State secondary. They have more of a running game, I'd say, Penn State than Ohio State does, based on the health of their two guys and Kate Tron Allen and Nick Singleton. And they kind of take the pressure off of Drew Aller a little bit. Yeah. But this is the game where, as I mentioned before, Aller has to step up. And if he's your big time quarterback who was waiting in the wings behind the veteran Sean Clifford last year, and they couldn't wait to get him in there. And, you know, they were clamoring for him last year as a true freshman when Clifford struggled a little bit and was up and down uh, during his uh, final season on Penn State. At Penn State. You know, this is the game if you're Drew Aller. You have to, it's it's put up or shut up time. And I get you're a young quarterback. This is a younger team than Ohio State. But again, I think Penn State has more than enough firepower to make this game close, make it a little bit ugly. You know, they don't have a, I don't think they have, as much of an explosive offense as Ohio State does, but they can really dirty the game up and make it ugly. So can Ohio mm-hmm. State, but I think if you're banking on just an explosion of offense, that favors Ohio State. And it's interesting you say your predicted final score around the 24-21 range. I mean, the total is at 45 and a half or 46, based depending upon where you look. So that could be about right. I just think it's going to be a little bit more high scoring. It's just a matter of does Penn State go back and forth with Ohio State or make that. things ugly for Kyle McCord? I don't think they're going to do it. I think they have the op- they have the potential to do it, but I think just based on what I've seen so far this year, particularly with Ohio State's win over Notre Dame earlier this year, I think they, I think the Buckeyes proved they can get down and dirty and not just be this finesse team because you know I don't want Ryan Day to suddenly hear this and call me out and saying you know hey Nick Costco said we're not a tough team so Ryan Day is calling out everybody saying this is a tough team. I think Ohio State is a tough team and they, they'll uh, I think they'll prove it again on Saturday. Yeah, defense to me wins these types of games. As I mentioned, they're limiting Penn State opponents who right around a buck ninety-three uh, per game, which is very impressive. You look at the pass defense, the efficiency as well. But listen, if Harrison, those wide receivers start to go off early and often, it, it, it it's going to be a long day. And I'm not talking about just beat you over the top. I'm talking about taking that ten yard out, miss tackle. Right. Yeah, and, and Harrison was a guy that was hyped as this generational yeah. wide receiver prospect, obviously due to his father, you know, his father's a Hall of Famer and for how good he's already been in college. And not saying he's not good. Obviously he had a slow start to the season, but he's starting to pick it up now because McCord is just suddenly firing on all cylinders. And this is the Kyle McCord that Ohio State and Ryan Day envisioned was going to win the quarterback battle yep. over Devin Brown. And now he's starting to show it. So, you know, the stats speak for themselves. He's only 1,700 yards. He's got 11 touchdowns and only just one interception. And again, Harrison, five of those touchdowns. So I think if he starts having a big game, it could be a long day for that Penn State defense. Uh, Tennessee, again, battle of ranked team, 17th uh, ranked Tennessee, 11th ranked Alabama. Kind of sounds funny to say, right? Six and one. Tennessee is five and one. Bama is laying nine and a half. And to me, I'm not even going to sit here on good faith and tell you, well, you know, is that kind of the recency bias? Well, you look at their last couple of games, right? They put up a boatload of points, 40, 26, and 24. But again, they're not blowing teams out, right? And their right. one test, they lost by 10 to Texas, second game of the season, 34-24. I feel as though this number is a little too high that's just the way I I I think nine and a half, 10, I'm not comfortable with that at all. Um, and I think it has to do with, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the first ranked opponent that Tennessee's facing this year. I believe so. And then you look at this game, everyone thought Tennessee could carry over last year's magic. Now, again, Hendon Hooker injury aside, and of course they eventually uh, fell to Georgia, but everyone thought, okay, Joe Milton looked good in, his relief appearances of Hennon Hooker last year. Yeah. I believe he had 10 touchdowns, no picks last year and down the stretch. He obviously had a great orange bowl in that win over Clemson. But Joe Milton hasn't been that Joe Milton this year. Now they've lost some guys to the NFL, you know, obviously due to, you know, you, you know you're not going to keep him around forever. So to me, Joe Milton is the key to this game for Tennessee and Bama's defense for what people will say about Alabama this year. I mean, they've been, as far as I could tell, Pretty solid defensively. Texas was really the only team that kind of exposed them. And if you look at uh, Alabama's last couple of games, yeah, they've been close, but also, you know, they're still gutting out these wins. It's more on Jalen Milrow and the Alabama offense to keep the consistency going. Because now Bama's starting to win ugly, and they're starting to win close like they did before they had the run of great quarterbacks like a Jalen Hurts, a Tua Tagovailoa, obviously a Mac Jones, and then you have a Bryce Young. 
Heisman Trophy winner. But you look at their last couple of games, 24-21 over Arkansas. They were dominating that game. And then the offense sputter and the defense, you know, if you give up 21 points in college football, it's like, okay, it's not the end of the world. You know what I mean? Yeah. But your offense only scoring 24. They were cruising up 24-6 in Arkansas, which is a down, it's on a down. They have a down year this year, despite the talent they have in that backfield with KJ Jefferson at quarterback and Raheem Rocket Sanders at running back. They made that game a lot closer. Miller uh, was forced to a couple mistakes. Uh, they beat Texas A&M on the road the other week, 26 to 20. You know, a little too close for comfort. And obviously, you know, the Jimbo Fisher conversation is a conversation for another day as well, but. Just it's it's just too close, and you know, Bama even beat Ole Miss twenty four ten, but they kind of controlled that game. But again, they're winning ugly. I think Alabama is bound to win this game ugly again, which tempts you to take the nine and a half. Yeah. I don't think Tennessee, uh, or, or sorry, take Tennessee plus nine and a half on the road yeah, here. Yes, yes, I, yes. I don't, I don't think this game's going to come down to a shootout. I think you're banking on okay, is Joe Milton going to be able to keep up with Alabama? I don't think so. So the way I'm looking at it is. Does Jalen Milrow for Alabama? Does he put up twenty? Does he put up twenty four points, or does he put up 35, 40 plus points against Tennessee? So I think Tennessee can make this a game. It's just a matter of what Alabama offense do you get? Do you get the more explosive Alabama offense when Jalen Milrow is on and he's firing off all cylinders, or are they going to start cruising late in the game and you have a twenty seven, you know, twenty type of game, maybe a twenty seven to seventeen type of game, and Tennessee is battling to make it close in the end. I think that's what it comes down to. I can't see Alabama losing at home to this to this one. I know they lost at home to Texas earlier this year, but Texas to me is far better than Tennessee this year. So uh, I, I'm taking Alabama to win here, Rich. But I, I, it's going to be a lot. Cl- I, I don't see a blowout. I really can't for at least just where I've seen the past couple of weeks. I think Tennessee will keep it close, but I don't think Tennessee is enough to win this game. But I'll, I'll take Tennessee plus nine and a half here. Yeah, I like the te- I, I like Tennessee with the points. I mean, if I can, if it if it closes at 10, 10 and a half, I'm I'm excited. Yeah, I would definitely then take him there. Yep. Yeah, you know, you mentioned Milton. He's only uh, completion percentage right around sixty percent. He's averaging just under seven yards uh, a pass attempt, which tells yeah, you he's not he's not what he was down the stretch last yeah, year. Yeah, they're they're not trying to exploit the secondary. They're not trying to throw the ball down the field. But I think if they can keep this game close within the number, they're going to have to figure out a way to run the football. They're averaging about five point nine yards on the ground. Wright's averaging about seven point one. Yeah. So you got that workman like. Um, running back by committee. I agree with you. I like Tennessee. Um, I like Tennessee in the points in this one. So, um, all right, here's a good matchup for you. Duke and FSU. I feel like maybe this should be played on the hardwood, um, <laughs> right? <laughs> Kurt Lugwood and Bobby Hurley. Uh, I mean, we obviously today. have a uh, traditional football powerhouse Duke right here in a yeah, ranked yeah. matchup against Florida State. <laughs> uh, let me check the, uh, I, I've been seeing a little bit of line movement in this game, which I'm seeing 14 and a half right now for Florida state. Yeah. It, it, it's dropped. Um, let me just pull up real quick. Give me one second. I am seeing do, 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 do. Yeah, actually it's, it's, it's sat at 14 and a half now for the last six plus hours. Now that's a seven thirty game. So that we might get a half a point drop. Yeah. Here, but again, a lot of points man i think a lot of it has to do with florida state being florida state and dukes had a really nice season five and one we talked about them a couple weeks ago their only blemish was a tough game a low scoring game against notre dame um they're not going to blow you away you know they they look clemson just a different animal to open up the season that's tough for anyone and they they've had some wins but again nothing of note um i just think 14 and a half these are your, I think you've heard me say this, my look, but don't touch. These are your typically maybe your 31, 17, 31, 20 type, type of game. Yeah, this is definitely a uh, look, but don't touch game for me. And the biggest question right now for Duke is if Riley Leonard is going to play. Their quarterback suffered that ankle injury the other week. He's been day to day. They're not going to make a decision, I think, until about Saturday morning. So nothing as far as I've seen so far today on this Friday, October 20th, I have not seen anything on Riley Leonard in terms of if he's going to play or he's not going to play. Now, again, he's not, you know, he's, you know, I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. He's everyone's new Josh Allen. Okay. Going into the uh, draft, Mel Kuyper loves him. So he's, he's like the next big thing. He's a big prototypical size. He's got a big arm. He can move around in the pocket. He can run, run and take off with the football. He doesn't blow you away with, with his stats right now, right. but he's obviously a game changer for Duke with the way he operates that offense. So, yeah, he can make some game changing throws. Uh, he obviously can just lower the shoulder and run over linebackers. He's that big and that strong. 
But even if he does play on Saturday, Rich, I mean, he's going to be limited, I would say, with that ankle injury. He's not going to be 100%. These guys never are at that point. So I don't care how much uh, uh, pregame tape or pregame um, help you give him, so to speak, <laughs> before they take on Florida State. I think the Seminoles are just too good for Duke right now. If he was fully healthy, I'd give Duke a better shot. Duke is legit. I think that that defense could really slow down uh, Florida State a little bit. But in the end, you're not going to be able to contain their weapons. Trey Benson's is in the backfield, and that's just a running game. Jordan Travis, Heisman contender at quarterback, and you have two receivers. I, I'm not sure if Johnny Wilson is going to play. I, I'd have to double check on that. I don't think he played last week, but Keon Coleman, who was basically brought in as their wide receiver too, the transfer from Michigan State, he went off against Syracuse last week. Had that big one handed catch, which made Sports Center top ten. He's been a revelation for that uh, wide receiving core in that offense. So I think Florida State just has too much firepower. They're going to run. They will run away with this game. As far as the Lions is concerned, you know, running away could be a relative term considering it's my look, don't touch game. So they could win this game by 25 or they could win by 12. You know what I mean? And, and just appear dominant in the end. So I'm not going to touch this game. The totals at 49 and a half. I would probably take the over on that just based on Florida State's offense. And maybe Duke could put up a couple more points as well. But I would say this one's all Florida State on Saturday night. Yeah, really good point with the injury to Leonard, too, because when you think about it, last year, 20 touchdowns, six picks, but he also added seven on the ground. His game is predicated on mm -hmm. scrambling. I mean, he's, you know, it's almost like what Jones was doing when you think about it, Daniel Jones, right? That Duke quarterback, I'm going to throw right. a little bit and I'm going to run a little bit. So the mobility is certainly going to be an issue. Look, but don't touch for myself as well. Costco joining us on a Friday edition of BYP. All right, you got Michigan, uh, Michigan State. I mean, you know, the horrible stuff in Michigan and the investigation. <laughs> I mean, what, what are we doing here? Yeah, there's more. It's all uh, it's all science stealing. Uh, more more credible evidence, I guess, came out from an NCAA report or from what the athletic was reporting and multiple other outlets reporting. I forget uh, the guy's last name is Stallion. I believe he's an analyst. He's like a recruiting analyst or some kind of football. Connor analyst Stallion. For... Yep. That's it. Connor Stallion. Thank you very much. Uh, not not the horse, obviously. So uh, he's he's been. No pun intended. Galloping over everywhere, apparently, allegedly going to uh, opposing stadiums, filming person signals. So, yeah, yep. so he's he's a person. So apparently, all of his social media has been scrubbed. So all of it. So his Twitter, his Instagram, uh, it's all been deleted and scrubbed. So and by the way, no, not to cut you off, he he's a retired captain. He's a, a Marine Corps. Is he is he the uh, military retired person captain of interest, in the United it? States Marine Corps? Yep. There you person go. Of there interest. You go. Be, be, yeah, because they, they, they said he was a person of interest and they they, they also sent around a, a, a former military uh, person. So I guess that I guess that is him. I guess I misread that. But it, reading this report is fascinating considering, you know, sign stealing with technology in baseball illegal. Is sign stealing in baseball actually illegal on the service of it? No, it's just frowned upon. But like, you know, the old you know, the old saying, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. You're not trying. And I'm not, and I'm not saying that sign stealing exactly is cheating. It's if. At that level, whether it's pro baseball, college, or, 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 or the NFL, if you're, I mean, if you're sign stealing, that means you're, uh, de you know, depending upon how you do it. But I mean, if you're doing it and you're able to decipher other teams' signals, where it's like two pats to the head, I'm patting my shoulders, and I'm giving you like, you know, the 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 yeah, check off, know, it's a run yeah, play off yeah, pack. Let, right, like, right. let's rock right here, like you yeah. know, people on video can see me doing all kind of crazy stuff with my hands right here. If you're able to decipher that and saying, all right, that's, that's on part. you. Yeah, that's on you. So if you're the coach, you should be, to me, you be able yeah. to disguise these or, you know, just really, I mean, I, I've seen a lot more, I guess it's only happened against Michigan, but I've seen reports of more teams that are playing Michigan this year. have just gone straight to the wristband. So the coach just calls in a number, quarterback looks at the wristband and they break the huddle and do whatever they have to do and just call the play out that way, which is fine. I'd say there's a way to defend against your signs or I don't know why they don't have the green dot on the helmets like they, like they do in the pros. If you just start, if you start installing radio communication between the coach and the quarterback, you wouldn't have these issues of sign stealing. But also, I saw this point as well because I know the the letter of the law is you can't send somebody to an opposing team's stadium and observe it in person. You can only use the game film that's provided provided to you in exchange between the coaches. But here's my other question, and I saw a great point, and it, it may seem very uh, – I don't want to call it low brow or, or just a very broad stroke opinion right here. But if you're playing, if you send somebody out there to go scout the signals, you mean to tell me that there's not one other person in an 80,000 person stadium that's not going to notice what they're doing on the sideline. Now I'm saying they're good enough to decipher those signals or to call out what formation or what alignment they're going to go in. But 
it's on public. It's not like you're hiding these signals from the entire crowd and only your team can see it. Yeah. There's 80,000 people that can see it. Plus, you can see it on television. So I don't quite get the letter of the law from you. All right. If you see it on video, go ahead. It's, you know, it's it's carte blanche. But if you see it in person, send somebody to go see it in person. You can't do that. So sign stealing or not, I mean, I don't know. No. Apparently, it's illegal to tape it in person. But you could see, but if you see it on video in what's voluntarily given you, that's okay. So sign stealing violates NCAA rules if right. a team uses electronic equipment, as you mentioned, to decipher signals and relay the information to players and coaches. So according to 2023 NCAA football rule book, again, quote, any attempt to record either through audio or video means any signals given by an opposing player coach or other team personnel is prohibited now going back to your other point these allegations against michigan i think they're a little more it's the it's more than the normal coach griping me saying hey man what the hell's costco doing on that the op opposition sideline right so you know i i don't know man you know you, you got some people coming out saying you know from the big 10 this is worse than what the astros and the the, the patriots friggin' had cameras going on during pre i mean i i don't i don't buy that i i you have to prove to me definitively with a shadow of a doubt that i'm recording something that i'm taking that information i'm using it to my advantage i'm having i'm sending it to someone else to decipher as you mentioned this this then i know it's a check off it's a runoff tackle and all of a sudden i can have my linebacker in position i can have my safety creak in a, uh, the back door to make that play right for the loss if you can't prove that to me then this is just all bs yeah i don't know what they're going off of necessarily other than the fact that i think they i saw they had quote credible evidence that this was going on so you mean to tell me that he sat in the stands of of other games when he wasn't active for michigan and was filming with a with a phone or with a, a some kind of other camera yeah, from the sideline that's like sitting in a movie theater back in the day in bootleg and i'm sitting there with a video camera you know on the projection filming the video and, like and what's and what's mind boggling to me i believe and don't quote me on this but i believe this is what i read okay i, I do want to go back and double check this but I, i'm pretty sure they reported that stallion was in attendance for to get these signals but he was actually wearing michigan gear where there was no michigan team present now either one He's really dumb. As a for, as a military man, I don't think he is. Yeah, and him I, and him I, I, being a military man, I don't yeah. think he's that dumb. Yeah. So basically, what this boils down to is Michigan's either really, really stupid. Yeah. And lacks severe intelligence to bend the rules. Yeah. Or this is much to do about nothing. And again, it comes. It but is the truth odd. always lies somewhere. It in lies between. somewhere in the middle, and it is odd that this comes on the heels of. I guess finally getting past the investigation during the oh, COVID sorry. season about you know yeah. Jim Harbaugh buying a cheeseburger for a recruit. Oh, even the NCAA, <laughs> yeah, even even though the even though the NCAA said it's not about a cheeseburger, but it essentially was about a cheeseburger, and he, and he voluntarily <laughs> took a suspension, a self-imposed suspension, by the way, where they were just like, all right, it was probably an under the table deal with Mich with uh, Harbaugh, Michigan. Like, look, I'll take suspension for three for three games. Give me my new contract. And that and it's funny because that's been in the works and that's been reported as getting closer for a long-term extension with Michigan. And now this comes out, which we, if you want to call it a bombshell report, I love how we're not talking about the game at all. Because I, I firmly believe that Michigan is just going to wax Michigan State this weekend and have really be no contest until you know, we see Michigan play Penn State and Ohio State. But I don't know what to make about this with Harbaugh until more comes out other than credible evidence and it's a staffer doing this. Harbaugh already said he had no knowledge of doing it, which all coaches are going to say that regardless if they knew it or they didn't know it. Harbaugh's not going to come out of the woodwork and say, oh, yeah, I knew about this. I sent him to go. I sent him I sent him to Easton Avenue to go find uh, Greg Schiano's lunch uh, lunch spot, and we will be able to decipher the uh, Rucker signals ahead of their game. So <laughs> they came to Ann Arbor. On a, on a, and by the way, yeah, Michigan's going to wax them. I mean, forget about the line 24. This – and I, I'm not – this is apples and oranges, so please, for people tuning in, I'm not comparing the two. But Harbaugh is a type of stature that Paterno was with Penn State when if somebody spit on the concourse, Paterno knew about it. So point right. being, Harbaugh knows exactly. All these coaches know whether they oh, want to man. admit it or not. I mean, it, it, you. 
I find it hard to believe if, if someone's going to come up to me and say, no, the coach didn't know about yeah. it. No, these guys know every single inch of their do. program on and off the field, just opens on up and the off door. campus. Just opens up the door for Harbaugh and Dallas. Just keep, you know, do, do, hey, just, let's just, I mean, I got to give credit where credit's Maybe due. this is all set up. It maybe could be. I mean, that's what Paul Feinbaum said this morning. He said, maybe this is fine. What the, the part that put this. Yeah. Is, yeah. This is the, yeah, this is, this is fine. The part of the NCAA that pushes yeah. Harbaugh back to the NFL. Now yeah. someone's going to have interest. I do believe the NFL is interested in bringing him back, whether it's, you know, who knows? Maybe the Chicago, maybe the Chicago bears Q, maybe the Chicago bears are going to have From the number one overall. They'll have the, 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 the top two picks. They're going to draft Caleb Williams. They'll trade Justin Fields, and we're going to hire go. Jim Harbaugh. Yeah, that's, that, that's the ultimate plan, the ultimate master plan for the Chicago Bears. But they'll but they'll wait for Jim Harbaugh to win a NCAA-tainted national championship sure, sure. later this year. Start <laughs> so, next to it. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And then he'll – you know, Pete like, Carroll yeah. action, you know what I mean? Then in 10 years or five years from now, Harbaugh is probably going to be doing uh, commercials for Best Buy and video cameras. You know, I mean, you have to like come full circle. If we're talking He'll about absolutely stuff, play into it. You can't tell me you yeah. won't. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's goofy enough. We know that to use one of our favorite terms on this on this lovely there's, program. There's a uh, buck to be made all the time. All right. Lastly, uh, Utah versus USC. Uh, Utah is ranked 14th. Uh, USC is ranked 16th. Um I like this matchup, man. I mean, you, we talked a little bit about Utah. We already know about the pedigree of UC, uh, um, USC, pardon me. Um, right. But here's a rarity, right? We're waiting to see if the kid can shake off a really bad performance. And by the way, before we get into the game, do you believe there is substance and accuracy to um, these reports about if Williams gets drafted? Talking about these NFL no, teams. No, no, I don't that's believe that's all BS, on. correct? I I, like- I I find it hard to believe that if a guy like Aaron Rodgers can't get equity in a team, or a guy <laughs> like Tom Brady can't, or if there's one guy who could do it, it might have been Brady with the Patriots, but even then they would I don't even think it's allowed but by the way. Why would you even come up with that? Not like what I mean, it was a it was a report, I believe, from Pro Football Talk. It was Mike Florio and company. They I think they reported that back in the summer. And then I, I guess it kind of just resurfaced over the past couple of weeks because it was amid his struggles. And it's amid a lot of talk that Caleb Williams is not 100% guaranteed to go to the NFL next Correct. year because he could, he, I mean, if anything, and I'll say this, I don't think he's going to stay at USC. I think he is going to go to the NFL. I think it's a bunch of hooey, to be honest with you. But if there was a guy who would forego being the number one overall pick in next year's draft and to stay in college for a massive NIL deal, It'd be Caleb Williams. Upset the there's no, part, there's no other branding in college football right now with a player with his stature from where he's geographically located in college football. And that brand that USC is, Caleb Williams could make more money in a single college football season next year in NIL deals. I could see it easily happening than he would on his first year of his rookie deal with, let's just say, the, the Chicago Bears. Right. Okay. And the only way I would see Caleb Williams not going to the NFL, forget the equity thing. He just doesn't want to play for a certain franchise, whether it's the Bears or someone else. He could easily that pull. I can see the latter. Yeah, that I would see because there were talks about how he wouldn't want to play for the Arizona Cardinals if they wanted to draft him. It could be the Chicago Bears for all we know. But we've seen Elway do it. Elway, obviously a Hall of Famer. Eli. One, yeah, Eli did it as well. Future Hall of Famer, regardless of what the haters will say to you, your face. I know. I, I know Eli's a Hall of Famer. I'll say it. Don't worry. I'll say it for you. But only two guys have really ever done that. Yeah. To pull that type of move and had great success. Yeah. I didn't want to go to the Chargers. Don't blame him. Went to the Giants, historic franchise, boom, two Super Bowls. John Elway didn't want to go to the Colts. Didn't not not a great franchise at the time. Wanted to, to go play to baseball. Broncos. Yeah, yeah, there yep. you go. He, you, he threatened to go play baseball. Now, can Caleb Williams pull that card? No, but can Caleb Williams pull the card of I'm not playing for your franchise? I'll, I'll go back to USC. Caleb Williams essentially does have a little bit of leverage here saying, I'm not going to play for you, so you might as well not draft me, or I'll go. I, I will go back to college, and I can make ten million dollars next he year. He does that, though, Nick. He does that. That upsets the apple cart for some of these teams that are, you know, what is it? Um, caving in for Williams or Caleb or tanking for whatever they tanking for. What? Remember the tank for two a year for yeah, Miami? The but, other, yeah. but that, but that you think about some of these teams right now that are probably thinking to themselves, you know, this kid's draft stock didn't go down because of one friggin' bad game. It didn't. Um, but again, to your point, you've got teams out there. Chicago, Arizona dealing with Murray. I mean, you're talking about the Giants now, buyer's remorse with Daniel Jones. There's teams out there that are looking at Williams saying, all right, this kid's obviously going to be the, if he comes out, the number one draft pick, right. period, right? Um, the most pro-ready quarterback out there. And it's, and it's fascinating in a quarterback-rich draft. 
he's going to be the number one overall pick. Yeah, yeah. I know there's talk about, well, Drake May could surpass him. Personally, I love Drake May. He's not going to. If you're looking at this logically speaking, no, he's all the hype, Williams. all the past results, even if Caleb Williams doesn't win his second nope. Heisman, God forbid, he is going to be the number one overall pick if he goes into the draft next year. That It's 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 without a shadow of a doubt. It's a fact. He'll go number one overall. I don't care who's drafting. Okay, The only way he doesn't go no, doesn't go number one overall is want to play for the team. If he, if he doesn't want to play for the team or the team that's at number one doesn't need a quarterback and they trade or, and you know and then he goes number two right. but they're gonna trade up they'll trade up everyone you, you need to be sure with a guy like that and again it's funny you say how it could change things if he doesn't go to the draft and he comes back to college plays for a huge Nil deal as I would speculate and obviously you know throw out a hypothetical there could it change how college football is run in the Nil transfer portal era it'll definitely accelerate the process. And it will change. It could change how NFL teams approach seasons, where you really can't tank in the NFL. You're gonna you're, you're gonna get everybody killed, okay? But you could be bad enough where you get the number one overall pick. I'm not, I'm not saying you intentionally do that, but it could change the speculation of, wow, maybe maybe like, if we tank, we're gonna get a lot of people fired, and all of a sudden we're still not gonna and, get that guy because he's going back and, to college. And, and are we gar- exactly? It's a great point. It's the guarantee now, where. How do we know this kid's going to come out? Like, this is the domino effect that a lot of people have not been talking about, because if I can bank Buck coming back one more year and make more, as you mentioned, instead of that top five, that rookie deal contract where you're getting me bargain basement prices, what the hell am I going to do that for? My stock was just gone in the days of the Sam Bradford rookie deal. You know what I mean? Now, I'm not saying Caleb Williams doing that is going to set a new precedent. It could Maybe start a domino effect, but it could but negatively impact how we look at draft picks going it could, forward. It, yeah, it could also negatively impact him if he makes more money going back to USC next year. Now he'll be a superstar at USC. Now, and if you look at it from the perspective of well, it changes the way college kids are going to going to approach the NFL, whether they want to declare early or not, or stay in college longer. He's almost an exception to the rule because of how good he is, and how popular he is, and how much he's been talked about in the Patrick Mahomes light. How he's the best quarterback prospect since and uh, since Andrew Luck, and obviously yeah. Andrew Luck got those John Elway comparisons when he was mm-hmm. coming out of Stanford. So he's on a scale up here now. If a guy like Drake May was doing this, we kind of wouldn't bat it. We bat a we, you know we would bat an eye a little bit, you know, say oh that's interesting, but he would get a substantial NIL deal from North Carolina, or if he went into the or if he was a grad transfer, just a hypothetical, you know, grad transfer, go somewhere else, play for an even bigger market or right. a bigger school, I should say. You know, I don't want to use the uh, you know school schools aren't employing these kids, Rich. So no, 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 not quite yet. So uh, it would be a fascinating story. I don't think it's going to happen. I still think he's going to go to the NFL because long term he will be a bigger superstar in the NFL if he if he is as good as advertised. And again, you know, people will say injuries. So there's no guarantee. So you can get hurt. You can get hurt in practice. You can get hurt in the NFL. Sure. You can get hurt in college. God forbid he came back to USC next year. Rich is playing for about $10 million in NIL money and whatever else comes his way at USC. Biggest superstar in college football. He gets hurt. Guess what? He still banks the money and he'll still be a superstar at USC for pretty much life. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, As for the game itself, it sounds like. <laughs> oh, yeah. Even... It actually is a good game. Yeah, it actually is a good game. at USC touchdown favorite. How are they going to bounce back after that blowout loss to Notre Dame? Um, we'll see. I think, I think Utah is extremely good. I'm always high on the Utes, Kyle Winningham and company, no cam rising. I don't think he, he might not be back the entire season. I think he's going to be, he's at this point, Richmond, he might be bound for a red shirt and come back next year because he's been out the entire, it's, it's really a shame because this Utah team, I believe is easily top 10 pushing. I'm talking pushing top five. If he's the quarterback, Utah, I, I love cam rising. I love Utah. They're an extremely tough, gritty team. That's how you beat USC. You you force them into mistakes. Utah's defense can do that, and they can play ball control. So is USC bound for a second straight loss? I don't think so. But if there's any team that could really upset them or, you know, kind of shake them around a little bit and really out-physical them, it is Utah. Don't forget what this team did to USC uh, last year twice, okay, regular season and the Pac-12 championship. So, uh, I'd be careful if I were USC. I will take USC to win the game, but seven points, that's a little too much for me, actually. I think this game's going to be really close. I, I feel like you just wanted to talk about the game because you want to sit there and say the two Utes. <laughs> hey, come on. It's a great movie. It's a great movie. I do love my uh, I love I love my Utes. Not the youths. I do love my Utes. Oh, uh, my God. How many fingers am I holding up? Let the record show. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about the game only and only the game here, not Caleb Williams uh, 
getting equity in the NFL next year. It's it's fascinating stuff. It does change the dynamic. He, of course, is uh, Nick Cosco does a great job. College sports on three sports voice of RU wrestling. And of course, Cal live sports, uh, all the high school football down in our backyard. Nothing doing tonight. Next weekend, you'll be uh, back in the uh, press box calling the action that we will off tonight. So catch the action next week. Cape Atlantic live. Uh, whoever mainland plays mainland is going to be the number one or number two overall seed most likely. So there'll be a number one seed um, in their sectional playoff bracket starting next week. They'll have a home game. They'll at least have one, if not two straight home games in the playoffs as long as they keep winning and maybe even host sectional title if they get that far. Uh, but whoever they play, it remains to be seen. We'll find out Saturday night, if not Sunday morning. Um, but that'll be at six o'clock. Most, I believe it's six o'clock next week, next Friday on the 27th. Mainly we'll host that first round playoff game in the uh, sectional playoffs here in New Jersey. All right, there you have it. Check out, follow at Cal underscore live sports. And of course, Nick at Nick Costco 59. Appreciate you, brother. Appreciate you jumping on a Friday edition BYP. Appreciate you as always, Q.